Okay, so Steve, thank you very much for uh, talking to the students at the University of Waterloo uh, today uh, in this recording. Um, you bring a wealth of experience around intre technical entrepreneurship and uh, I'm sure they're going to benefit greatly from what you've got to say. The first question that I've got for you is that you're described as a serial entrepreneur. I'm particularly interested as to what's kept you involved with that. What excites you about tech startups? You know, it's very interesting. Uh, people talk about entrepreneurs as being uh, agile and relentless and tenacious, and all, all those are true. But um, one of the biggest things that drives, I think, uh, serial entrepreneurs is that they're uh, forever curious. And, and, and for me, curiosity is what moved me into a variety of industries. Um, I did eight startups and only two of them were in the same industry, which were semiconductors. And if someone would have said Steve Blank, the semiconductor guy, I'd laugh because I would never describe myself as that. And I, I always describe myself as I couldn't believe they're going to pay me to learn about this new industry. Um, so that's why I do it. And that's why I do what I do now is, um, you know, teaching stuff you know nothing about on day one. Um, um, certainly is perhaps the best education and and uh, you know just for entrepreneurs particularly those uh, starting out it allows you to ignore everybody else's dogma um, whether you're a new educator or a new entrepreneur because part of the principle of you're too dumb to know it can't be done is in, a, in play um, and that's in fact that's been the story of my career absolutely and uh, and you did challenge established thinking with the lean startup approach. You're associated with that, possibly the founder or one of the founders of the lean startup approach. What do you think the key differences are between it and the way that things were done in the past? That's a great question. Um, so in the past, how we used to build startups is uh, essentially thinking that they were nothing more than smaller versions of large companies. And what that meant was is that um, investors, in, particularly in Silicon Valley and, and elsewhere as well, in the 20th century simply looked at a large company who implicitly knew who their customers were and knew who their competitors and knew pricing and said to startups, you know, they write business plans. We want you to write a business plan. And they, you know, give us five-year forecasts, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. We want you to do that. And by the way, when you start the company, they hire VPs of engineering and they essentially build the product and then they ship it. And we want you to do that. Well, what could be wrong with that? It's what big companies did. What no one ever stood back and realized is what big companies actually know is they have a series of knowns. That is, they know all the things I mentioned earlier. But in a startup, you have a series of unknowns. Most often is you're not just entering an existing market you're actually making a set of guesses about, you know, where the market's going, what features customers want, how to price it, who's the competition, etc. And so the way you think about it is large companies execute what's called the known business model. They know a lot of stuff. But the biggest insight that kicked off the lean startup movement was, well, large companies execute startup search, and they're searching for a business model. And the, the thought that hit me, which still is kind of interesting 15 years later, is we spent 100 years building tools for execution in business and those in, in places called business schools, um, you know, starting with Harvard in 1908 and then in Canada and other places. We built a century of strategy tools, tactical tools, you know, operational tools, all around execution, because if you remember, the name of the, the degree was the Master of Business Administration, not business search or startup. And so when I looked around, I realized there were no formal tools. There were a lot of great war stories, and people told you, you know, how to, you know, what they did to overcome obstacles, and they all kind of sounded like Joseph Campbell and the hero with a thousand faces. That is a great journey. But there was no methodology. Where was the rule book <laughs> that was different? The only rule book you were handed was use the the company rule book. And so the Lean Startup started from these observations that startup needed tools to search. And I'm happy to describe the, the tactical implementation of that, but the strategy came from just kind of saying the emperor had no clothes and that 
let me tell you, it was a very only place. Just me and my dog believed this in the beginning of the 21st century. Um, I find it incredibly amusing now that it's taught in 160 universities and, you know, the U.S. government has adopted it as the basis of commercializing science and our Department of Defense uses it. Um, but, but it was kind of like not common wisdom at the time. You look back and go, well, why did we ever think this or to think something different? And, and this is another reminder to young entrepreneurs is you shouldn't care what everybody else thinks. I mean, the, you know, the only thing unique about the Lean Startup was I did it when I was old rather than young. It's, it w would have been something this radical coming from somebody doing their PhD, PhD thesis. But, but you need to remember if you're an entrepreneur, don't care about existing dogma or whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, plus, you're young enough to get it wrong multiple times. I don't know if I answered your question. I'm happy to go through the details of Lean, but I think the where it came from was was to me uh, equally interesting in, in hindsight. Yeah, and I think uh, you know one of the reasons it's so popular, perhaps, is that it does seem to uh, make sense to the people who uh, are introduced to it. It, it's, it seems like a sensible way to behave, and, and of course, the the approach itself has influenced. Uh, all sorts of areas of business now. Basically, the idea that you're going to, uh, as quickly as possible, share your ideas with other people and get feedback is, is influencing all sorts of different things that certainly I come across today. So the customer development process is one of the three components of Lean. Uh, the, the three components are uh, Alexander Oscar Walter's Business Model Canvas, my customer development methodology, and something called agile engineering, which is just a engineering methodology to develop products iteratively and incrementally. And I'll explain them in context, but we'll start with customer development. Uh, customer development simply says something which you kind of laugh about, but it's, but it's true, is that there are no facts inside your building. So get the hell out. Um, or, or in Canada, get the heck out. Um, which, which simply means... Um, you could be the smartest person in your building. And in fact, let's just assume you are in a startup, but there's no way you're smarter than the potential intelligence, uh, or the collective intelligence of your potential customers. So why are you talking to yourself or your other peers in the building about the commercialization potential? That is, who to sell it to, what features do we need, how to price it, whatever. And in fact, customer development starts with the with the idea that except for maybe the, the kernel of the technical idea you have, which might be a fact, everything else about your business is nothing more than a series of untested hypotheses. Whoa, that's a big idea. Because the real word, world, the real word for hypotheses outside the university is guesses, which means you're actually just guessing about all the components of, of what makes a startup a business. Again, your technology might have been proven in the lab. Sometimes that's doubtful, but let's give you that. But all the other pieces. And what startups used to do was just simply hire salespeople or marketing people. And why? Because it says so here in the plan. Without ever testing up front any of those hypotheses by the founders. And the customer development process is simply says the founders need to get out of the building and test a series of hypotheses and validate or invalidate whether they're true. And the, and the way they do that is, one, by talking to a lot of people personally, not SurveyMonkey, not, you know, via email or phone, but watching people's pupils dilate when they talk to them. And that just means high-resolution video Skype or uh, in-person interviews. And at the same time, they're building what are called minimum viable products, which are, it could be a wireframe, it could be a PowerPoint, it could be you know, a prototype of a feature or a clay model of some hardware or something. But um, MVP is not just a simplified product. It's, in fact, anything that maximizes learning at that period of time. And the question is, what are you trying to learn? And that actually gets us back to Alexander Osterwalder's business model canvas. It turns out this guy named Osterwalder about five or six years ago managed to put, you know, probably 5,000 pages of PhD theses and other people's books of what the heck is a business model into a single piece of paper. And he said, look, you know, we could, we could, you know, sell you a lot of dead trees to explain it, but really 
a business model is the nine things you need to worry about when you're building the business side of your startup. Who's the customer? What are you building for them? You know, what distribution channel do you use to reach them? How do you create demand? How do, what's your revenue strategy and tactics? What activities do you need to do and what resources do you need to do it? And what need any partners and what are the costs? Those nine things are the entire business model canvas. Now you all know what a business model is. And by the way, you could go download this, this single piece of paper. It turns out that what we make people do in the lean startup is simply, you know, spend a half hour and think about and extract what are your initial hypotheses about all these things. Post them on a business model canvas in yellow stickies and then use the customer development methodology to get out of the building and test the customer problem, see if your solution matches it, and answer the questions about which are faith-based hypotheses and which are fact-based as quickly as possible. And in the meantime, in parallel, use the third part of um, uh, the Lean Startup, Agile Engineering, to build minimum viable products instead of going through a waterfall or, or serial process of product design. You build your product incrementally and iteratively, getting feedback almost continuously as you learn. And that's the lean startup. And, and just for your students, you should know, and doing all this will absolutely not guarantee that you become Facebook or Twitter or Google. What it, would get, what it will guarantee is you will minimize or compress the amount of time you need to learn fast. Not fail fast, but learn fast. And it gives you, for the same amount of money, more shots on the goal than you would get if you just did this in a serial process. In the old days, you know, we we start a company, we design the product because the founder believes they absolutely understand the customer problem uh, and therefore can implement the solution and then ship the product. And only then would we find out whether anybody cared or needed it. The lean startup process, again, compresses that cycle dramatically. So you get multiple shots on the path to, to before you run out of money or time. Okay, and I noticed as I uh, have done work for this interview and, and within the development of the course that I'm working on, uh, that in the courses that you run, you get people out of the building as quickly as you can. And I was keen to basically get any advice you might have for people on this process of getting out and talking to people. What type of things should they think about as they do that? What they're looking for is not to ask people gee, do you like my demo? Here it is. Or here's my PowerPoint slides. Take a look. Um, we let everybody um, or make everybody leave their computers home the first couple of times <laughs> because their instinct is a default to that. And particularly if you're an engineer, you know, making eye contact is kind of like hard the first couple of times. You know, the difference between an introvert and an extrovert uh, for at least the scientists and engineers I teach is whether they're looking at uh, their shoes or my shoes. Uh, and the goal is, and we, we've succeeded 100%, is to actually have them make eye contact. Let me tell you, my classes, they talk to 100 to 150 customers in 10 weeks. Excellent. 10 weeks. Uh, and online at steveblank.com are free videos um, to actually see how this discovery process works. So if you go to steveblank.com, there's a tab called slides uh, slash videos. Just click on the tab. And you'll see how other students uh, have gone through this interview process. Excellent. And, and I'll make sure that in the course materials the students have, uh, that links to these materials are available to them as well, which will, uh, uh, which will help them to get there if they're watching the yeah. video. And uh, there's a ton of, uh, just as an aside, there's a ton of resources. Uh, you know, you said earlier, I just want to emphasize, the Lean Startup just isn't steep blank. You know, my best student, Eric Ries, wrote a great book called The Lean Startup, Alexander Osterwalder's uh, Business Model Generation book, and he wrote another one called Value Proposition Design. There's now kind of a, a series of people who are stacking up on the idea, and I think we're building the equivalent of the, you know, execution stack of, of management tools. We're now building the equivalent of the lean or startup stack uh, of, uh, of management tools. So lots of stuff out there. All they need to do is Google lean startup and they'll be way ahead of the game. Yeah, I, I'm especially intrigued to see how the approach seems to be moving into all, all sorts of other management areas now yeah. too, uh, as far as, you know, the approach that people should take to things. It's quite fascinating. 
I thought you might explain next, if I can ask you to, uh, what a pivot is. Uh, that seems to be an important part of the Lean Startup and what it is and when people should do it, how they should know when to do it. So a pivot um, in technical terms, and then I'll explain what it means in the real world, is a substantive change to one or more of the business model canvas components. And what that really means is you've been out of the building, you thought your customers were, you know, urban youth, you know, 14 to 15, and you find out it's middle-aged moms in Edmonton. You know, <laughs> oops. <laughs> you know, okay, and, and by the way, those middle-aged moms are happy to buy the product, but that wasn't your original strategy. Guess what? You could either decide to ignore that data or you could make a substantive change and say, oh, well, this is now who we need to create demand for because they're going to be buying a lot of this stuff. That's a pivot. Or you decide, you know what? We've been trying a freemium model that is give away the product and have them upsell later. Yeah, the giveaway part works, but no one's upselling it. Well, we found out if we actually put a price on it, people value it more. That's a pricing strategy change. That's a pivot. A iteration, by the way, would be I'm changing the price from nine ninety nine to four ninety nine. That's an iteration, and and it's you know there's no memo that you get the difference between an iteration and a pivot. But I use the word substantive. And how you find that out is you're out there talking to people, um, and you're trying and you're running these MVP tests. And you actually, by the way, these tests that I'm talking about are really designed as science experiments, just like you would design an experiment in the lab going, okay, let's A-B test some feature, or let's test some pricing. or But remember, you can't even do that until you truly understand what we call the customer archetype or persona. That is, who do we think our real customer is? Is it, you know, you and, and by the way, every student starts with end users, you know, or business people. No, that's not an archetype. An archetype might be, Kids who like video games, who action 13 to 14 and a half, who have previously bought these four games, um, who have Sony PlayStations 3 through 4, but not Xbox. And that, now you're getting to an archetype. Or, you know, um, CIOs in companies that process wood pulp on Thursday. That, that, that's kind of, and, and what's also interesting, just as an aside, about some of these things, and I've been talking about customers, but we could be, building um, uh, MVPs and, and pivoting in different areas. We could be pivoting about who our partners are. We could be pivoting as, oh, my gosh, we discovered, you know, if we build it in China, it's a lot cheaper than building it here in Canada or in the U.S. Major pivot because now all, all of a sudden it affects a lot of the other parts of the business model is going overseas to China has upsides and downsides. So, again, a pivot is a substantive change to one of your uh, key components. Why this is interesting and why it, you know, like most students go, yeah, okay, yeah, I got it, so what? That wasn't hard. Is to think about how we used to pivot in the 20th century. And, and students today don't believe this when I tell them, but in the 20th century, it used to work like this. You'd raise money from an investor in the U.S., a venture capitalist. Uh, they'd read your plan. They'd say, great plan. They'd read Appendix A, which was your five-year forecast. They'd give you money. You'd go off and build the product. What would you build? Well, you wrote a spec. And you didn't talk to too many people, maybe somebody in your dorm room or some friends or you were a domain expert. You'd spend a year to two building the product. You'd go to alpha test, beta test, first customer ship, first customer ship. The first time you'd actually test whether your plan is working because your VP of sales would come in and tell you how the numbers are matching the plan. And almost often they would say great pipeline instead of we're making the plan. And the great pipeline is a euphemism or a fancy word for we're not making the plan but we think we have lots of prospects. And month after month, this would repeat until the divergence was so big that the only part of the plan you were making was the burn rate, that is your expenses, but the revenue wasn't matching. And so what would happen is the board most often would fire the VP of sales, first person to get fired for not making the plan. So we'd bring in a new VP of sales who would look around and he or she would look at the old plan and say, well, that's a stupid plan. Here's our new sales plan. Guess what they just did? They did a pivot. The only way we used to pivot, and by the way, this would repeat, repeat for nine more months. If the sales still weren't, wasn't working, we'd fire the VP of marketing um, because we'd say wrong position. The new VP of marketing would come in and say, well, that was a stupid strategy. It turns out in the 20th century, the only permission we had 
or the only view we thought was possible was that the plan was inviolate. It was handed down on tablets from God. And the only possible reason it couldn't be working is poor execution by executives. No one ever stood back and said, well, maybe some of the assumptions of the plan are fundamentally incorrect. There was no even concept. It's hard to believe we spent 30 years never challenging the dogma that it, half the time in my age startups, I wrote under the influence of either alcohol or other things I can't talk about. And, and yet I managed to raise money for it, and we never once challenged those assumptions. So the pivot is actually just mind-shaking from people who grew up in the 20th century building startups, and of course, the students in the 21st century. On a similar note, another uh, term that is common is customer validation philosophy. Um, you perhaps have explained some of that already. Is there anything more you'd want to? Sure. And this one for students is uh, is kind of fun. Is ah, oh, Professor Blank, I, I you know everybody loves my product. Well, why? Well, I asked them if they loved it, and they said yes. And usually you get two phenomena, certainly on campus. One, who'd you talk to? Well, all my friends. Well, did you talk to a bigger audience? Well, after you beat me up last week, we talked to people who aren't my friends. Where? Well, on campus, of course. So, so number one is you really haven't gotten any validation if all you're doing is talking to all the people who you know or on campus, unless that's your total available market. Um, it, it, the, the real part of customer development and discovery is, and validation is, is getting out of your comfort zone and speaking to people who you think might be potential customers, but you don't know. And that's easy to do. And, and again, those tips and techniques on how to do it could be found on steveblank.com. But the biggest part of validation is thinking that even when people say, oh, I love it, who well, you didn't know, that you've been validated. The only true validation, only true validation is whether someone handed you some money for an unfinished and untested and buggy product. Absolutely. Whoa. Who would, do, who would do that? Well, other crazy people would do that. And it turns out there are plenty of them. And, and by the way, there are some business models who like, like a Google or, or Twitter where, in fact, you wouldn't get money, but at least you could test usage. Are people grabbing it out of your hands to use or show their friends, etc.? And if you can't validate, when we say customer validation, we mean give you money before it's built or start using a buggy on an unfinished product you really don't have a business here. You might, but the odds and the data say probably not. And that's uh, the short version of customer validation. Accounting for startups. I hear it said that it should be done differently because account startups aren't big established organizations, but h how should it be done differently? What's this look like in practice? Well, you know, we have this idea called metrics that matter. And... You know, in a in a large company, uh, what you worry about is again income statement, balance sheet, cash flow. You hire accountants to do that. It's pretty clear um, what's your cash burn rate, and the the number you're taking in should be bigger than the number you're spending. But in a startup, what you're really accounting for is, you know, at first the number of hypotheses you tested, the number of pivots, and, and then ultimately you're setting up a a uh, set of metrics that actually matter to you. Is it, you know, you figured out customer acquisition cost, um, or if we figured out if it's a viral product, uh, do, do we understand virality? Do we understand scale? You know, do we have a handle on our burn rate? Um, is there, are we in an existing market or a new market? So do we understand that our sales curve is either diagonal as we take market share, or is it the classic hockey stick where we're hoping for some uptick and therefore we truly need to constrain burn rate because we know we're going to have a long period of, of no sales, um, and do we understand the diffusion of innovation curve if it's a new market? So the, the numbers are all kind of different for startups, and they all kind of get back to, for an entrepreneur, for a student, is this worth spending the next three or four years of your life building this? Is this a lifestyle business? Is this a small business? Or is this a scalable startup? And if so, uh, have you figured out what scale is necessary and, and could you raise capital um, to, to get this thing started? Or can you start it in your laptop and have it go viral without any capital? All those are wonderful opportunities that didn't exist when, when I was an entrepreneur, uh, particularly this notion that on your laptop 
you have access to more computing than existed in all of the world when, when I was an entrepreneur. And by the way, the cost of the software startup has gone down by a factor of a thousand. A factor of a thousand in 30 or 40 years. Unbelievable. You no Amazing. longer need to, need to spend millions on hardware or software or whatever. You could do this on your credit card. I mean, you literally right off your, uh, your uh, computer tapping into you know, cloud-based computing like Amazon Web Services and others. Can anybody be an entrepreneur? So that's a great question. I got, you know, I was a practitioner for 21 years, and my friends uh, who knew me would laugh hysterically when I told them I was teaching entrepreneurship. Because, Steve, you were born entrepreneur. You can't teach this. Mm -hmm. And I realized that um, when I was teaching it, uh, this is another hand grenade I've thrown into education, was that we were making a mistake. We were teaching entrepreneurship like it was accounting. You know, no startup is run by an accountant. Right. So accountants just simply don't run startups. So the question was, you know, what were we teaching and how and why? And, and uh, I realized that founders of startups are much closer to artists than they are accountants. Um, what that means is, you know, an artist, a, a composer, a sculptor, or a painter sees something that no one else does. And they spend years bringing something from inside of them outside so they could share it with the world. Most painters don't paint for money, they paint for passion. Most successful founders are not building companies to make a ton of money. They're building something to express themselves. And one of the nice things about capitalism now is that an outcome is a ton of money, probably more than any other profession. But much like art, most of you will fail. But you're doing it anyway because it's important to you. And so to answer your question, We've kind of learned 500 years ago on how to train artists. It's a, some theory, you know, mixing colors and, you know, perspective, but a ton of experiential hands-on. And we learned 100 years ago to kind of differentiate between going to Juilliard or a conservatory where you've already said, I want to be an artist, versus art appreciation or music appreciation, which we even teach in the primary schools. You know, that is young children to self-identify whether I'm an artist or not. I believe those metaphors are identical for entrepreneurship. That is, we should be teaching entrepreneurial appreciation at the youngest possible age, just to let people know, wait a minute, yeah, I don't even want to have a lemonade stand. I want to take over the entire neighborhood. Lemonade. Great, you know, there's something inside of you. But then when you take some of my classes, the Lean Launchpad class, for example, you have self-identified as, I'm a hardcore, I want to learn this thing, and I want to be tutored, but you know, by the best with the best methodology, and I'm willing to expend all that energy. And I think in entrepreneurship education, we need to differentiate the, you know, entrepreneurial appreciation classes, which I think everybody, at least in the university, ought to take one, versus the no, you know, I've been writing code in my dorm, and I want to know how to turn into a business, and I'll do anything to learn that. That's a very different set of classes. So the and the answer is to answer your question now. Asking, you know, can anybody be an entrepreneur is like asking the question, can anybody be an artist? Right? Well, everybody should try their hand at art, but no, everybody can't be an artist. An artist is a calling, not a job. So is entrepreneurship. If you're not called, it's okay, because that means you're normal. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs and artists say, share the same characteristics of their insane. Um, they're driven by a passion that's much deeper than, you know, putting food on the table. That's the best I can answer. What do you feel about social entrepreneurship? That's been talked a lot about today and uh, is seen as uh, something that might address uh, social uh, concerns in a, in a bigger way in the future. Uh, how significant do you think it is in addressing societal issues? Well, you know, social entrepreneurship is uh, the 21st century version of NGOs or nonprofits, and uh, I think maybe with a much uh, smarter approach. Um, one of the problems of using the Lean Startup methodology, though, is it's very hard to have metrics that matter in NGOs because some, uh, sometimes we confuse donors' intent or, or mistake donors' intent uh, for a customer, and that really does get confusing. And and how do you measure uh, success here? Uh, because it is a nonprofit. Uh, difficult, but not impossible. 
you've taught technology entrepreneurship extensively, and uh, uh, what do you think is the best advice that you can give to people who are uh, thinking about their first startup today? What's the most important thing for them to remember? So the most important is also the most hard is the hardest. And in fact, there are two most important. Um, you know, one is the confusion about whether your technology insight is a company, and and if you're just the technologist, well, gee, you know, what else could it be? I'm just going to develop this, hand it to somebody, I'll hire a salesperson, and they'll sell it, and we're done with this. Now, how hard could this be? And by the way, that's just you know, well, someone else will do it. I I don't need to know any of that stuff. That's the company, and and the sobering fact is that um, it's not the, your technology or invention is about at best twenty percent of what makes up a successful company. It's all these other pieces that you, as the founder, need to learn. Not so you could do them as your career, but you will, if you never know how to talk to a customer or, or what's a business model, you're going to be um, BS by sales and marketing people and finance people the rest of your career, you're going to be the chief scientist sitting in the corner. Um, and if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But if you want to be running your company or at least owning a good chunk of it, you need to understand that it's not just the technology. And that leads to the second most important thing is, no, I know you might be uncomfortable talking to people who are not your friends and, and you know, talking to people you think are dumber and whatever. Welcome to the world, my friend. If you if you want to just be a research scientist, you don't need to do that stuff. Great, sit in the corner and go do research. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, you've just signed up for a much more difficult thing. Not technology difficult, but emotionally difficult. And the good news is what I remind scientists and engineers, and I've taught this for years, is they are capable because they have excess compute horsepower of emulating empathy. Um, we could teach them how to go into emulation mode and talk to anybody. Then when they, you know, go back to their lab, go back into high bandwidth mode and, and just, you know, work on technology. But, but to actually build the company, it requires a different set of skills we could teach you as long as you understand that you have to put some emulation capability at, at work. And so those are the two things. Uh, one is you know, technology and invention is only a small part of a company. Two is you need to get out of the building and learn a set of skills that are not uh, particularly natural to you, but you certainly have the compute horsepower to kind of emulate. That's the answer. Thank you very much, Steve. And I really appreciate you taking the time today to uh, uh, to talk to the students. Uh, the, a lot of people will, will get the wisdom from your words in the many times that this that the course, which this will be part of, will be offered. So I'm really grateful to you for taking the time. and. Uh, Thank you. Good. Then uh, hopefully we'll see uh, the output of your students uh, in products we use nearby. So take Absolutely. care.